We had a blast at StarCast 6. A huge thank you to everyone who attended. And if you want to relive our stage show experience, you can with Premier Streaming Network. Over 20 stage shows took place StarCast weekend. From comedy shows, design panels, musical performances, talk shows, and more. Including a live edition of AEW Unrestricted with CEO Tony Khan. Sign up for Premier Streaming Network today and check out the shows available now on demand and in HD. And if you sign up today, you'll get two months free of Premier Plus. Enjoy the amazing lineup of content that Premier Streaming Network offers, including all five previous StarCast stage show lineups. Hundreds of hours of fantastic wrestling content at your fingertips. Visit StarCastOnPremiere.com. symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, this is Kurt Angle, and welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. On the show today, I won't be the only Olympic gold medalist on here. But first, let me introduce to you my co-host, Paul Bromwell. How you doing today, Paul? Hey, Kurt. Doing great, man. Great to see you, as always. And you're right, we do have another special guest this week. We're on a roll, man. The last few weeks, we've had some great guests. Uh, hey, by the way, before we jump into things, how was Aerosmith? With oh, the wife. Last, my wife loves Aerosmith. And we went there and it was it was it was one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Uh this and Kiss are the two best I've ever been to. And I've been to Ozzy Osbourne and other other uh um bands, but yeah, Aerosmith was awesome. It really was. I saw I saw you singing along and uh having a good time there. So that was a lot of fun, man. I'm glad you had a good time. Uh so I had to bring it up. The other thing I wanted to mention before we jump in is big news this week as you and I are recording, it officially went down. The WWE and UFC have all merged. It's TKO. Kurt, if this takes place while you're still in the WWE, do you think your career is different at all? Or or what do you uh, think? You know, no, probably not. And I'll tell you why. UFC didn't start getting really popular until I was knee deep in WWE where I was winning world titles and having a lot of success. And then I broke my neck the following year and, uh, just wasn't going to be possible. But, um, I think that, um, these guys are going to cross promote pretty well. I mean, I could see like a Roman reigns, you know, promoting UFC or a Conor McGregor promoting WWE, that kind of stuff's going to happen. I believe. You talk about a Conor McGregor. He even has a little bit of that McMahon yeah. strut about him. Yeah, he has that entertainment factor. Yes. So that'll be a lot of fun, but it's official. Vince McMahon, no longer the main man when it comes to WWE. I never thought we'd see this day. Uh, blows my mind. I, he told me once before when I went back to WWE that they would have to pry uh, the WWE from his cold, dead hands. That's what he said to me. Well, they used a lot of money to make that, that actually happen, pal. So anything's, you know, can happen when you're talking, you know, millions and billions of dollars. And so there's that, uh, other thing I wanted to touch on. Yeah. I'm holding you accountable, pal, because last week you went, oh, and two, the jets, they did win even with Aaron Rodgers blowing out his Achilles. He, he, yeah. He got, he got hurt. <laughs> oh, can you believe that? I mean, I felt so bad for him and Jets fans. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, they, they had such high hopes having Aaron Rodgers there, and they thought he was going to be there for the whole season. Unfortunately, he's not. It's, uh, it's, it's sad. I think, you know, the New York media, everything I did watch hard knocks. I got to see his interview with Aaron, uh, with Aaron Andrews. Everything was the build him coming out on the field with that American flag. And it's like, oh my God. Uh, so yeah, you picked them wrong. Okay. And then listen, that's not the only thing you were off on because the Steelers got the that's shit beat out of them. <laughs> yeah. 
So are you ready to try this again? You're Owen too. You ready to go? Uh, Two more picks this week? Yeah, yeah. I'm due, man. I got to get at least one victory here. All right. So who is your ankle lock? They are a lock to win in your mind for week two. (laughs) This is easy. Kansas City Chiefs. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. You had them going over the Jaguars because they need it. They lost to Detroit and and Kansas City's the away team this week. But Patrick Mahomes rebounds and that's your lock. Yes. Yes. All right. Kansas City. All right. What's the angle upset of the week? Oh, man. I got to go with the Steelers over the Browns. I think they're only a one and a half point underdog. Okay. It's, it's going to be a pretty close game, but I, I think the Steelers are due and they need a win right now. Okay. We're going to make a little bit of a, of a deal here on the show. If the Steelers lose again, dude, you're not picking them at all on the show, the rest of the damn the season. The season. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm tired of it, but you're yeah. right. Browns are the favorites. They put a, a whipping on the, uh, the Bengals. I mean, come yeah, on. which I was really surprised to see that uh, you know, the Bengals have a solid team. Oh, well, hell yeah. Joe Burrow, the, uh, the highest paid player in the NFL now. Yes, he is. And he deserves it too. So there you go. You're picking the Steelers again. My God, Kurt. (laughs) Well, listen before one more thing before we jump in. And that is, I wanted to bring up a few weeks ago here on the show. We talked about the beat down that your buddy Brock Lesnar put on Zach Gowan, who is truly one of the most unique stories ever in wrestling. Zach joined us recently over on ad-free shows and talked about what his goals were as an aspiring young wrestler. And I thought it would be cool just to take a listen to this. Let's check it out real quick. All I wanted to do when I started wrestling was to be a high school math teacher that moonlights as a professional wrestler on the weekends and to meet Sabu. That was my only goals in wrestling were to, to moonlight as a professional wrestler and to meet Sabu. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. And so if you look back and you, you list off those names that I got to work with and travel with and, and make a little bit of money with, it's just so insane. And it makes me so grateful that wrestling has given me way, way, way more than I deserve. Listen, guys, I got to tell you, if you want to check out more of this interview with Zach Gowan, plus thousands of hours of content, bonus content, there's now a special offer going on over at AdFree Shows. New subscribers can save 20% off their first month by going to adfree20.com. That's 20% off month one right now at adfree20.com. The interview is just, it's its amazing. You'll find out things that you never know. And Zach, he's a, he's a lot of fun on this, Kurt. And so we want to encourage you guys to take advantage of that special offer right now. One more time, adfree20.com. Kurt, with all that out of the way, buddy, it's time to welcome our guest. That's Let's right. bring him in. Rulon Gardner, welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. That's right. Olympic gold medalist, Rulon Gardner. Welcome How are we doing, show. boys? <laughs> oh, thanks for letting me come on. I'm excited to to be uh, able to get my angle of uh, wrestling. I guess you could say. <laughs> you know what, man? You had a lot of success in your career. You and I wrestled together in college, but we never faced each other, unfortunately. And uh, I would have liked to see who would have won. Who do you think would have won? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you beat Sylvester Terke. I, I couldn't beat him. And Terry K was a six nine behemoth, and you were about uh, what seven eight nine inches shorter than him, and you yeah. outslept him like nothing. You were so slick in college. It's very few people. Well, you won the NCAA championships. There was nothing like Kurt Angle when he hit his when he got moving and hitting his slick shots. Nobody could compete with Kurt Angle in college. But I, what I remember about you, Ruan, in college and afterward. You are the hardest working wrestler I've ever seen. Nobody trains harder than you. And, and you know, I, I see that you did a lot of exhaust training like I did for the Olympics. So, you know, you train till you're exhausted, and that's when the training actually began. And I think, um, you know, we both had a similar, similar uh, training methods. And uh, I, we both had a lot of success, too. We both won Olympic gold medals. Oh, yeah. I, well, I remember going into 96. I, you know, I met you a few times before, but – you know, Bumgarner brought us into Edinburgh and me and you, we actually stayed in a hotel room and, you know, you were, you were methodical. I'm like, what are you getting up? Oh, I got to take my, this at this time. I got to take this at this time. I got to take this. You had a plan and all the rest of us are like, I guess I'm going to McDonald's for breakfast. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, yeah. I, like, I have some serious OCD, Rula. <laughs> oh no, that's dude. You, that's the only way you succeed in life if, is if you have a plan plan and you had the plan and 
you knew exactly what you wanted, and that was to be an Olympic gold medalist. And boom, you know, before you know it, I remember the final U.S. Nationals between you and uh, Mark Kerr, and holy cow, I remember that, that whole match right at the end, Mike. It was about gone to fisticuffs because you guys were that Adam about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you guys, you got you guys showed us younger guys what hard work and what commitment was and what success was at the highest level. And for us young, inspiring athletes, that was the, you know, it's almost like a, a roadmap to success. If you follow this, you'll end up, at, end up at the top. And that's exactly what us young athletes did. We all saw it and we're all, I want to be a Kurt Angle. I want to be a Bumgarner or John Smith or any of those guys. Yeah. Well, listen, in my research for the show, I found that you were shot in the abdomen during a show and tell by an arrow. Is this true? I would like to say I got shot, but you're dealing with Ruland Gardner. And Ruland's not the smartest kid in the schoolyard, if you know what I mean. Because here I was, I took a, 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 a basically a practice arrow and a killing arrow, and I took it to school and I walked in and I and I was getting ready to put the arrows away and I and I was walking back to the classroom. I dropped the practice arrow, so I bent over and stabbed myself in the abdomen with the broad with the you know broad head and stab myself with an arrow that's how smart i was in fourth you grade you did it to yourself <laughs> i did i know the teacher came in and there's an arrow sticking out of me blood everywhere and the teacher's like what happened he's like ruin was trying to put the arrow away he's like oh that makes sense so here i am walking to the hospital with an arrow sticking out of me in wyoming in 19 you know probably uh, <laughs> at that point it's probably 1970s, well, 19, probably about 1978. So the Wyoming wasn't the most technologically sound you know, state out there. So it was always a challenge for us growing up. For, well, for me growing up in Wyoming, it was. Well, you know what? I will tell you this. Um, there are a lot of instances in your life where you have defied death. And I'd imagine this was one of them. And we're going to talk oh, about yeah. the others later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This was kind of the star. It's just every day growing up on the farm is almost the near death experience. It's like, well, I could die this way, this way, this way. Which one is going to be your way to survive today? And that's what I got good at doing is surviving those, uh, those adversities. Roland, when you weren't trying to physically impale yourself or have an adversity like that, buddy, you were a standout in football, wrestling, track and field. You were doing it all. Did you know once you were done in high school that wrestling was was your dream? Oh, not in, not until probably at the end of college. You know, okay. was it really my dream? Because for me, growing up, I was the youngest of nine children, and my brother Reynolds, who went to Oregon State, he ended up. Uh, he was a, you know, he was a year older than me. So I couldn't beat Reynolds until I was a senior in high school. So I got tortured by my brother every day. You'll never beat me. You'll, you'll always be second best. And so that's what drove me, even though I didn't have technique, it, you know, that, that drove me to have that grit, that determination to keep pushing. When most people quit, most people gave up. I'm just like, there's no way I'm going to lose now. And you say I'm a standout in football. I was a you know, all state in Wyoming and that's okay. You know, wrestling as a one-time state champion, but in the discus, you talk about standout. I remember being at state track and John Godina, you know, threw the discus a hundred or 220 feet. I threw it 140 and at state. I'm like, maybe I'm not that good at track after all, but John Godina ended up uh, winning the state championship by, you know, his throw for 75 feet in high school shop. Well, mine was 50. So I realized there's a whole nother level of athlete that I had never seen. But I inspired to want to be that next level. Mm. Well, you went to the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, and no one ever expected anyone. No one expected you to defeat Alexander Karelin. Did you think you had a serious chance? Not, not realistically, because the, the the process, and you know, you go to make the Olympic team, you got to go to nationals, and you know, you win nationals, you get to set the mini tournament, and then you go to the trials. But going into 2000, I'd only been wrestling Greco for four years because all the way growing up through high school and into college, I'd never wrestled internationally. And then I wrestled for two years on the, the freestyle national team until about 95, 96, where I committed to go Greco. And then 97 was the only year I went to the world championships. And that year I, re I went and wrestled Corellan. And then Corellan, I ended up getting thrown on my head in the in the semifinal match and i got thrown on my head and i actually 
broke two vertebrae on my neck. Wow. <laughs> so pulled a good angle, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. We know the only time before that I'd ever wrestled, you know, the stud like Corell, and here I was getting hurt, but that's just what you learn in life. And then what was crazy is going into, you know, 2000 Olympics, I ended up uh, um, beating, you know, I ended up beating or, uh, Gafari finally made the Olympic team. And you know how it is. You get, you make the team, you get that little bit of swagger. You're feeling good about yourself. A month before the Olympics, I'm like, ah, I'm the number one man. I'm going to Russia. And I made it to the finals and Corell didn't wrestle. So then number two Russian, and the guy, his name is Yuri Petrakiev. And I went out there and I wrestled and I'm like, I'm going to show him I'm the man. I'm the American. I'm, I beat Gafari, who won the silver. I'm going to kick his rear end. 13 seconds into the match, he hip tossed me and pinned me. One month <laughs> before I won the Olympics. And so I came back to America humiliated. You know, I'm like, this is bull crap. But I got, I got, I got put in my place. And that was probably the best loss I ever had because – when I came back, I knew I had one month to prepare, got ready. You know, and as I went out there, you know, I, I won my first match, second match, third match, fourth match is against the Israeli who was from Russia. And I just wore him out, wore him out. And I beat him. And, and what was kind of funny is, you know, Coach Frazier and the coaching staff, at the, you know, the Greco team, like Ruland, he's scared. He's nervous. He, we've never seen Corell and he's not warming up. You know, he's either taking you very lightly or he's nervous and he was taking me too lightly. And that's exactly what we wanted. This is a guy who's been undefeated for what? 13 years. No, not just undefeated, dominated. His I game. mean, every my, turn. I mean, he hadn't even he given up a point. Yeah. He hadn't even given up a point. I don't think Yeah, oh, six no, years no, prior no. to the Olympics. You know, you, you walk, you walk out there and, and Carell and just knew he was going to win. And so it wasn't even a question if he's going to win, it's a question of how far or if he's going to break your neck or if he's going to, you know, throw you and, and be a 10 nothing or how he's going to beat you because he just puts so much pressure on you and he scores that first point. It's like a steamroller starting going downhill and he did, he just run you right over. And before oh, you man. know, it, yeah. Oh yeah. He's just, you know, he's like Brock, you know, you started those big matches or, you know, like it's like Gable Stevens, you know, it's like the question I'd like to see is Kurt, how would you have done, got done against Gable? Oh, uh, that, that's a good question, man. I don't know. I, I think, um, honestly, I think I would have beaten him, um, uh, just because he was so young and not, not to take anything away from him, but I mean, he was 21 years old when he won the Olympic gold medal. And I was really surprised that any heavyweight could win at that age. That that's pretty damn impressive. But um, I did want to get back to Alexander Karelin. Yeah. We're talking about a guy that when he would lift people, they would literally try to pin themselves before they got thrown on their head because they didn't want to break their neck. And Alexander Karelin was doing this to everybody. He would do a reverse gut wrench and lift you up and toss you on your head. And uh, these guys were rolling over and pinning themselves. I mean, it was ridiculous. And uh, so I can't imagine how terrified you were, Rulon, when you wrestled him. I mean, this guy is the most dominant figure in wrestling history, and you ended up beating him. How do you when prepare you walk, for something like that, Roland? Roll, how, how do you go into it? When you walk in and he shakes your hand with both of his and your arms get swallowed up by Carell, and you're just like, <laughs> this, I'm like, that's a big old dude. I'm like, it's sure it's going to be fun. Because I I'd finally realized at that point my conditioning was my key. Mm. If I could just get into them, get into their grill, because these big keep old the dudes, close, push, right? Oh, yeah, keep we'll keep us close, but push the tempo, you know. And it's our coaches were like, hey, you know, first contact, you know. And once I figured out, you know, once he started figuring me out, change the tempo, change the speed, change the physicality, you know, you make these big dudes always having to catch their weight, always having to try to catch their balance. You just drain all that muscle, and that's. That was the goal with Corell is make him move, make him get out of position because he's just going to lean on you until he wins. That's who he is, what he does. But once you, you know, once he gets real physical, you become real fast. You start moving him. You start, you start making him react to you. And then once he's just sitting here reacting, then you get physical and hit him in the grill and you get real powerful, get real nasty. And he's like, you're going to, you're going to beat the, the champion from Russia. And so it was always kind of a mental game because I'm only 6'1". Carell is 6'6". So it's not like I had any intimidating factor. It's all about, you know, figuring out a way to get these guys 
to lose who they are as a wrestler. If you wrestle all of us, you know, thousand matches with me and Corellan, in that thousandth match, I'm going to maybe, what, you know, it was 2001, the odds of me beating him in the Olympics. But if you continue to pressure and pressure him, everybody, and you know this, Kurt, everybody has a breaking point. You know, Corellan had never seen his breaking point because everybody expected him to win. And that was what I was, I didn't think going that, going into it, but that's exactly what I had done. I was just like, you know, I have nothing to fear from him. Yeah, he's probably going to beat me. I'll have a cool video to show my kids someday. Hey, this is where grandpa broke his neck. You know, that's, you know, that's the cool thing. But I wasn't going to fear him just because he's undefeated. You know, it's like when you were training with Bumgarner and I was too, you know, I asked Bruce, I said, Bruce, why are you training with me? He's like, Rulin, you don't fear me. You know, most people in America fear me. You come after me like you think you can beat me. I'm like, uh, of course I do. Yeah. You know, that's that's the only way you could be as a wrestler. You have to believe you can win every match. Did I think I was going to believe it, beat him? No. But I at least had a chance. Hey, Rulon, besides me winning a gold medal with a broken freaking neck, this is one of the biggest moments in U.S. wrestling when you won the gold medal, is it not? I think it was because – it put the sport of wrestling, I think, on the front page of wrestling in the world. Or I think it put wrestling, USA wrestling, you know, US or wrestling overall on the front page because it's all over so the many, place. Yeah. Yeah. So many people in, you know, Russia growing up, so many people in Russia are like, who's this kid that this farm boy that beat our colonel, you know, Alexander Karelin and the, the normal people in Russia, the poor people, the, the peasants, the people that didn't have any money, they were just like, man, this ruling gardener, he's something special. How can I be a ruling gardener? I want to be just like that. And these kids in America are being like, how is it possible this, you know, and people used to say, oh, he's pudgy, this, that, the other, and they beat this, this man child from Russia. Well, hard work and determination and, you know, kind of staying true with that that commitment to to be something special we want to pause this episode of the kurt angle show to tell you about kurt and i's new favorite app and it's game time it's the place to go for tickets to all things sports comedy shows concerts wrestling you name it game time has it especially those last second tickets when you're on the fence but just not sure and i'm telling you if you can find tickets cheaper on another site Game Time's going to credit you 110% back. They even have event cancellation protection. So if your favorite performer decides to cancel, they have protection for you in that event. They also have a 24-hour return guarantee. I'm telling you, I've had some terrible experiences with all the other ticket apps out there, not with Game Time. They even provide job loss assurance. No one else has that. If you prove proof of job loss they're going to refund your tickets i don't know that it gets any more fan friendly than that so snag the tickets now without the stress with game time you can download the game time app create an account and use code angle for 20 dollars off your first purchase that's right terms apply again create an account and redeem code angle for 20 dollars off Download it today. Last minute tickets. Remember, lowest price and it's guaranteed. So many great events. You can take advantage of it now. Whether you're a fan of the NFL, wrestling, music, it doesn't matter. As I said, Game Time has it all. You can see awesome pictures of the seats. Look at the sections, and they are so fan friendly. There's no mistake about it. Game Time is the app for you. So check it out now. Create an account. Use code ANGLE and $20 off your first purchase. And overnight, you literally turn into a national hero. Were you ready for that responsibility? Oh, you didn't. I didn't have a choice. You know, I was yeah. like, next day you're like, and I called back home. I'm like, oh, it, what, what's going on? You know, have people heard about it? And they're like, have people heard about it? You know, I got back from, uh, um, you know, I was coming back to the States and we did Jay Leno. And, you know, my whole hometown you know, everybody from my hometown showed up to the high school. And, you know, that was part of the, the skit on Jay Leno was here. I had the whole town and ruling and it was, I was just like, uh, it, it just, just nothing. Some people expect that, you know, Kurt, I don't know if you would even expect that, but some people live off of that. And for me, I just wanted to make the Olympic team. That was my goal was just to be an Olympian. I didn't even care if I won a medal. 
but I was going to go out and give my best effort. But that day it was, it was something that truly, I have no idea how it happened, why it happened, but I was grateful it did happen. Well, Rulon, what do you remember about the match itself? Like your strategy, what was your strategy? Well, going into it, you know, they're like, Hey, you gotta, you gotta hit Corellan. You gotta, you gotta let him know that you want this more than he does. You gotta smack him in the face. You gotta let him know that you're not going to back down and, and, and make this easy on him. So you come after him and you get really super aggressive, you know, keep it close, you know, make it a close match. And when he, starts, you know, getting position, you got to make sure that you don't let them score because the longer in the match, the match goes and nobody scores, the better ch your chances are. You, uh, roll on, you're the only man to ever win a world and Olympic title in Greco Roman wrestling as an American. How big a deal is that to you? As you look back uh, on your life? Um, you know, being an American and, and, you know, you had Matt Kafari, you know, he had, he had won two, uh, you know, he had, he had won three overall medals, you know, all silvers losing to Corellan and then Byers won and, you know, different guys in Greco Roman had won medals and freestyle. That's a whole nother level of greatness in America that, you know, most people don't know the difference between the two, but to be a, 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 a two timer, you know, world and Olympic champ. And then, you know, to come back afterwards and win the bronze medal, it, 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 it shows me and, and makes me, uh, you know, so happy that I could be able to represent the sport in all of its glory. Did I expect it? No. But I now take that and I take that as now a responsibility to continue the the future of the sport of Greco-Roman in America. And that's that's what it's turned into is being able to make sure that I have the same opportunities that the next generation has also. Well, what do you remember about the match itself? No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, did the WWE come calling you after this? Well, the WWE did first uh, come calling in 2000. And uh, <laughs> the first conversation is um, I remember being uh, still in Sydney and and one of the, the press guys from USA Wrestling said, hey, uh, I got a call from USA Wrestling. You know, when my mom was there and my dad was there and you know, are you interested in talking to him? My mom's like, really? I don't know about that professional wrestling stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, probably not. So let's just put that on hold for now. And that was 2000. So that tells you more of what's coming in the future. My mom was like, Rulin, you need to stand true to, to who you are and what you are. So after that conversation with mom, you said, yeah. I'm, I'm going to hold tight. And yeah, I mean, listen, this is when Kurt's career starts to starts to take off around this time. Oh, it, it, it did. It did. And, you know, my mom was the same one as going to the Playboy Mansion. You know, do I go to the Playboy Mansion? My mom's like, really? Did I raise you? I'm like, no. Okay, of course. Right. So, so there was a lot of things I didn't do and a lot of things I got to do and a lot of things I was asked. You know, it's my mom, you know, she was, you know, she raised nine of us children and mm. it wasn't easy on the farm and all that stuff. And she was such a truly special person. So for me to be able to, to, you know, win the Olympics and do what I did, you know, I, she was, she was the reason I'm still alive today. Well, if M MMA had been larger at the time, more popular, would that have been something you'd be interested in doing? Well, and you know, 1996, we were training down in, uh, Arizona and I got to train with Fry and Severins and and Kurt was down there and those are some were you fighting people. training or wrestling training? Uh we were just, you know, at that point they were asking me to wrestle with them. And right. I remember after practices, Fry's like, dude, he's like, you got a real good future in MMA. I'm like, why? He's like, you're such a good wrestler. You know, you you understand what to do in the fighting game. I'm like, Okay, well that's great. I still got I still got my Olympic medals to win, and that's why and that's why a lot of these guys that you know come in, they make one Olympic team, and they quit it. You know, they get out of wrestling because they never won a medal, and they go into the MMA world and they succeed. It's like, man, us wrestlers got to win medals first be, to be able to transition to that next level. But that's something I believe in. But yeah, no, I it, it was in the thought processes. Um, 
you know, but it wasn't something I was focusing on because my goal was to wrestle until 2004 and then retire 2004 and go back and become a teacher like I always envisioned. That was my that was my dream. I want to fast forward to uh, 2002. Can you talk to us about your snowmobile snowmobile trip and and how that just completely changed your life? Yeah. Um, can I back up real quick for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In, in 2000, you know, I'd won the Olympics and then 2001, um, I went back to the worlds and I was in the quarterfinals against, uh, the Russian who had threw me in 13 seconds a month before the Olympics. And, you know, we were wrestling them and we were in the quarterfinals. If I lose, I'm out. And I go out and I try to throw him, they counter me for two. And then he takes me down for a third. And so I'm losing three, nothing with two minutes left. And then, you know, time expired. I had 15 seconds left. I had been throwing them and everything else and everything else and everything. And I couldn't beat them. And with 15 seconds left, I thought, you know what? Psh, you beat, you beat them last year. You, know, you won the Olympics last year. You don't have to do it this year. I said, bull crap. Yeah. 15 seconds. Let's go. And I stepped in, I body locked him and pinned him as time expired. The number two <laughs> Russian who took over for Corella. That was the quarterfinals semifinals. I went out and beat uh, Moryenko and he was in, we were in the clinch position and he's about six, seven and he was coming after me and I full body locked him, took him straight over. And then my finals against a guy named uh, Deke Bardos from Hungary. And he was six, seven, six, eight also. And I went out and beat him in the finals to win those matches. And, you know, I'm six, one and, you know, I'm, I'm at weigh-ins that year at all one. And I'm like, man, you dudes are huge. I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm the shortest guy in here by, you know, four inches. The Venezuelan is like six, five, and everybody else is taller. And the Hungarian's like, yeah, you're the only one, only one with an Olympic gold medal. So we don't feel bad for you, Rulin. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, so that was, you know, that was kind of the, the journey. And, you know, it, I wasn't a really, truly special wrestler, but to come back and to do what I did, that, that I took my, took my heart and soul and every ounce of, being that I had to do what I did. And so I came back two months after I won the worlds in uh, 2002, I went back to uh, Wyoming where I'm from and the Salt Lake Olympics had just started. And I was with two of my friends who were snowmobiling and we decided to go snowmobiling um, Valentine's day. And we were up in the mountains. And the problem was, is I sweat so much wearing all my full gear on. I didn't take my coat and was up snowmobiling and got separated from my friends. Um, and I couldn't find him. And the one friend, he was like, I'll wait here for you. And couldn't find him, couldn't find him, couldn't track him down. And by the time I was looking for him, I dropped off the side of the mountain. I couldn't get back up the mountain. So I had no other choice but to drop off the mountain and try to find another way to get back to the valley I'm from. And that's typically following the Salt River where I'm from. And I'd never been up in this area. And basically, I got stranded. And I got wet and I ended up at one point pulling my snowmobile backwards and I fell into the river. And so I stood up and everything I had on, T-shirt, sweatshirt, fleece top, not a winter coat. I left my snowmobile in the river about 7 o'clock at night and went up and found uh, a place to lay down and sit down and waited from 7 o'clock at night until about 6.30 in the morning. Um, I had had a vision um, where I saw Jesus and God, my brother, who had passed away and asked for another chance to live. And I remember sitting there and uh, my mom, uh, the reason that, that I'm alive is, you know, imagine myself, you know, having my mom find me like in Jack Nicholson, the shining, you know, him being frozen to death. Mm. That was the vision that kept me alive was my mom knowing that I quit on myself and I'd never quit on myself. And so at that point, you know, I was lucky enough to survive until seven o'clock went down, found a, a place down by the river, got a drink of water. And I was sitting there thinking, here you are dying. And all of a sudden a uh, life flight or a helicopter airplane shows up. And then uh, he saw me and he tipped his wings. I see you. I'll be back here shortly. And after three hours of circle me at 10 o'clock, they finally, they finally came in the helicopter, picked me up, got me to the hospital. My core temperature was 80 degrees when I got to the hospital. I pulled out and I got off the, the hospital, the helicopter and I tried to get in a wheelchair, but I had a foot of ice frozen to the bottom of my boots. And I stepped in and out of the snow and it was packed down. And I got into the hospital. They cut the, they cut everything off my body except 
from my boots and he had to use a cast saw to split the boots in half to be able to pull it off. And he's like, your feet are frozen solid. You got to go somewhere else. So they flew me to Idaho Falls, Idaho, went there. The doctor there said, you're going to lose your feet within the week, you know, at the ankle. You'll never walk. You'll never wrestle. Your, your wrestling career is over. So you got to you gotta change the way you think. And I'm like, my sister shows up. And she, the oldest sister, her name is Scary Jerry, and she shows up. And she's a cardiologist. And she shows up. She goes, what's our plan? Well, we don't have one. She goes, well, I talked to this doctor, this doctor, this doctor, this, this is what we're doing. Well, I've never done that. She goes, we have and we will together. And luckily, I survived that and just lost one toe to amputation. Mm. Now, Rulon, is this true that you uh, kept your toe? I did, of course. Where is it? It's a, it's a souvenir. I ended up uh, finally getting rid of it because what's what do you do? You make a mistake. What do you do? Do you, you throw that second place trophy away? No, you put it on the mantle front and center so you see your failure. I don't <laughs> What's that? He, I don't do that. <laughs> he, he, you get rid of your second place trophies, Kurt? I would get rid of the toe is what I'm saying. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm not talking the toe. Uh, it's toe is a, the toe is a symbolism of failure. Yeah. Uh, so, mm. no, I, no, I kept toe the toe. Failed, you're right. Yeah, oh, no, I kept, I kept the toe, and I had it for a while, and, and people are like, why do you keep it? And I'm like, you want to see when – you make bad decisions. And when I got to the hospital, I didn't take any painkillers. I'm in the hospital. They're like, don't you want something? I'm like, nope. My body's trying to teach me a lesson. My and I'm like, my body's, you know, if I lie to my body and say, oh, well, it doesn't hurt that bad. It's not that bad. My body's like, this is really bad. So, so yeah, I didn't, you know, it was, it was, it was a, the end of the day it was one of the worst days of my life. Now it's one of the most amazing from what I learned about myself. And Roland, just from doing research and, and, and hearing your story, there was never a doubt in your mind that you wouldn't return for the 2004 Olympics, right? No, no. And, and the reason I survived that night was because of my mom. And, and mm -hmm. you know, she always said, you set a goal, you know, I, it, in Nebraska, my senior year, I ended up not winning a national title. And, you know, some people said, quit school, go make the Olympic team. Some people said, quit school, you know, go, go have fun and party. Some people said, Hey, you know, you know, you need to stay in school. And my mom was like, Rulin, why are you here? I said, to get my degree. She goes, don't sell yourself short. So you need to follow through. And that's exactly, you know, when I started wrestling in 2000 for the Olympic team, I made an eight year commitment, win, lose or draw. I was going to wrestle for eight years. And my goal was to win two Olympic gold medals. That was my dream. Well, Rulon, do you think you'd make it back to the medal round in 2004? I, <laughs> so I came, so 2000, 2002, the frostbite happened. And through the year I started training, I went through four surgeries. I lost one toe to amputation. My lower half of the foot, I can't feel. So the first practice in Colorado Springs, I'm walking out there, boop, trip and fall. And I'm like, oh, you know. You know, first practice, I tr I tripped and failed 30 times. And everybody's like, dude, you can't even walk. What are you doing on the mat? Byers and my training partners, Trio Byers, went and won the Worlds that year. He had like, a lot of success, too. Yeah. Yeah. Byers is the baddest-ass dude in America, and you can't even walk. You think you're going to beat him? You're a fool. You're this. You're that. And I said, all right, whatever. That's your opinion of you. I said, but you know what? I know what I can do. And I went out there, and within uh, – Starting to train in September and April, I beat I beat him to win the U.S. Nationals in April. And then 04, same thing. I went out. Well, you know, the story is just crazy. I went out in 2003, made the world team 2004. I'm getting ready for practice. I had, you know, won all the matches between. Everything was looking really good for nationals. There's a week before nationals. I'm on my Harley in Colorado Springs heading down to practice. And I look up and I'm going about – uh, 40 miles an hour down the back streets in Colorado Springs lady pulls out in front of me and I T-bone her going 30 miles an hour. And I end up hitting her and going over her car on my motorcycle. And I went over her car. And as I got in midair, I'm, I look up at the ground. I'm like, you know, you got a duck front dive roll. So I dive rolled out of an accident 
did a front dive roll and landed it, and I bruised my heel. When I got up and I bruised my heel, you know, the guys, there's the people that are like, get on the ground, you're hurt. I'm like, I gotta go to practice, man. I'm like, I don't practice, <laughs> you know, I gotta get to where my workout. And so we went up, and uh, that was on uh, Monday that week. And they went in, they did therapy on it, and they're like, dude, you're crazy. And like, you've been through so much. I'm like, but I'm just, I'm, I'm here to make the Olympic team. I don't wanna lose folks as my, of my goal. And so that was on Monday. On Thursday, I was wrestling a guy named Corey Farkas. And I beat them uh, 10 nothing in practice. So on Friday, they're like, oh, we'll just go in and wrestle. And Farkas doesn't show up. So I have nobody to train with. And they're like, go play basketball. I'm like, I don't play basketball. I'm a wrestler. Let's go wrestle. And I looked around. I had Justin Ruiz, all these guys. I'm like, who's going to wrestle? And everybody's like, dude, when you get pissed off, you're not very nice on the mat. You are very focused. I'm like, who's going to wrestle? And they're like, nobody wrestles. So we went up to play basketball. And we're going down the court. We won the first game. We're losing the second game uh, 12 to 2. And I'm going down the court, and Daryl Christensen comes up to defend me. And I, you know, cross, you know, cross dribble, boom, and kick the ball off my foot. And I'm like, bang! I was so pissed off. Come so far at this point, run over, and I punch the bleachers. I punch the bleachers, and I dislocate my wrist. And I look down, and my wrist is laying on my forearm. And I'm like, what the, f-? you know, Joe Warren, world champion, the uh, Bellator MMA fighter. Joe Warren's like, what the fuck? And I'm like, so I reach down and I replace my wrist. I'm like, it's fine. And I could dislocate it each joint one at a time. We came back. We were losing 15 or 12 to two. We won the game 15 to 13, by the way. I scared the hell out of You really have to finish the game. <laughs> oh, you see? You, you start selling, you finish it, right? So that was the battle I had come through just to make the team. My up. goodness. And you talk about putting your feet through a beating. If it wasn't for losing the toe, now you're bruising your heel in a motorcycle accident. I mean, my goodness. So okay, your wrist. I mean, you are just going through it. And so I want to talk about, obviously, there's major differences between what you're doing in 2000 to now what's happening here in 2004. You know, obviously a little older, right? And you got all the physical issues going on. Talk about the the speed of the sport. Had that started to change at all in your mind just with those four years? Um, you know, I think you had the big Egyptian who wrestled uh two twenty, you know, Gaber. He was uh he was like six seven, six six, and he was a throwing machine. You know, I saw the difference of him, um, the heavyweight weight class. It was about the same, you know, I don't think it really had one dominant, you know, buyers had come in. Uh, I know the Russians had one or two Olympic champs uh, by, you know, buyers. Uh, Lopez hadn't come on the scene yet. So there wasn't really one dominant heavyweight. So was, he was it from was Cuba, like, right? Lopez? Yeah, Lopez. Cuba. yeah, the Cuban. Yeah, he hadn't really come on the scene yet. So it was wide open. So I'm like, well, she, I, you know, there's no reason why I can't go in and win. And, I'd made it all the way to the semifinal match uh, at the Olympics. And it was one-to-one in overtime, perfect position. And I just, you know, I was attacking him. I had to score out of the clinch and I'm attacking him, attacking him. And he knee tapped me and, you know, I can't feel my feet. So he tapped me, took my feet out and I went face first down to the mat. He went around and scored. He went around and scored and, you know, beat me. And I was just devastated at that point because I'm like, all the hard work, everything else. I'm like, okay, well, now what? And all the national media, they're like, you're a failure. You failed. You didn't win a second gold medal. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, isn't winning the gold medal the only thing in life that matters? I said, no. And you didn't win. I said, I haven't won a lot of matches, but it doesn't mean you quit. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I win the bronze. And my bronze medal match was against the Iranian who was 6'9". Mm-hmm. And he'd been throwing everybody through the tournament. And I just – Went out there, and once he had set his feet to throw, I'd move my feet, change position. You know, he could never get set, and I ended up beating him 3 nothing to win the bronze medal in 2004. Now, which one was a bigger accomplishment, Rula? And was it winning the Olympic gold medal in 2000 or overcoming all the adversities and getting a bronze in 2004? Well, um, if you ask Steve Frazier, he thought the 2001 Worlds was tougher because – I didn't ask Florida- about <laughs> <laughs> you know for me I'm kidding, you know, go ahead go ahead <laughs> no, for, for me it was like 
the the worlds in a one. It, those are special things that man. It's just you put it all on the line. You put everything you've known about life out there, and you let it. You just see what happens. And uh, you know, by far, you know, two thousand one was great. You know, but two thousand, there's nothing that could be as special as you know is beating the unbeatable. You know, it's it's Andre the Giant. It's it's you know just the the unbeatable who is is fearless who becomes yeah 100 percent. well in 2001 you won the worlds um now a lot of people don't understand this but world championships you don't have to qualify for so every country is valid to be able to go to the world championships the olympics you have to qualify for so let's say rulon gardner goes to the qualifier the pan am games he doesn't place he has a bad tournament He's out. And and anybody in the USA that represents him, if it beats Rulon Gardner for the Olympic team, they're out too because nobody qualified. And so the Worlds are actually a little bit harder to win than the Olympics. And Rulon won the Worlds too. Hmm. Yeah. I, I I won a little bit of both. And I think they're own special in their own way. And that's part of, I think, part of the Greco battle right now is we're not able to qualify all of our weight classes because – a, our athletes are not, they're not technically advanced enough, physical enough, all the, the different tools to be in the best out there. And that's our problem in the Greco side is we don't qualify. But, you know, you look at the mystique of the Olympics compared to the world, man. You know, there's no, there's no country out there that could compete with our freestyle team on the world or the Olympic stage. And it's just right, so right now, right now, today we have the greatest oh, yeah. freestyle team of all time. We do. Oh yeah. We, it, it's loaded. Oh, my, yeah. oh yeah. It's loaded from, you know, one position and not, you know, to the next, every one of those guys is going to win a medal. Listen, you weren't done with what you did and accomplished on the mat because then you write a book, never stop pushing my life from a Wyoming farm to the Olympic medals stand. That's not something you imagined right on a farm in Wyoming growing up. Was it writing a book? Tell us about that. No, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, everybody's like, Oh, write a book, make a million dollars. And <laughs> you know, you, you know, it, it, you know, not everybody who writes book, you know, writes books, you know, wants to you know, do it for money. But for me, um, you know, my mom, she was such a valuable part. She's like ruling. She goes, if you can have somebody pick up that book and read that book and see the stuff and the, the adversity you went through, like I had a learning disability. And the day I left for college, my mom says, ruling, remember who you are, where you're from, you know, and don't let anybody ever define you because as I was getting ready um, I was talking to some different uh, colleges and the high school advisor said, you go to college, you're going to fail. You're going to flunk. You'll never make, you don't have what it takes. And I told my mom and I heard her sit down with the advisor and say, how dare you tell my son what he can and cannot do. The only person that's going to determine his destiny is him. You do not have the right to do that to my son. And that was for my mom. And that's how, that's how profound, you know, the defense of, of the siblings and stuff like that. And so I think it's so important to have her, you know, want me to be able to share my story through a book. Eric Bischoff here again, telling you about our friends over at savewithconrad.com. Now, Conrad's always talking about how they are helping homeowners save money, but did you know that Conrad and his team can also help you become a homeowner? They make the home buying process more enjoyable than I don't know, making out with Stephanie and Linda. Ouch, but don't take my word for it. I'm Willie Proctor, and I'm from Martinsburg, West Virginia. I came with uh, Save with Conrad to buy my first home. Is that once I, you know, listened to the podcast, I, I was I heard other testimonials and uh, how easy it was. So and that was the whole process for me here was wanting for convenience. Oh, it was a, it was a pleasure. I mean, it was like working with family. It really was like, you know, being from West Virginia. You know, it's it's all about family here and. And that's what it was like working with Conrad's team. You know, I worked with Larry, uh, Holly, and Francis, and they were just, it was just like, I thought I was talking to my aunt or, you know, talking to my dad, you know, <laughs> it was it was a great experience. Yeah, this is actually the house I grew up in. So that was kind of the whole thing. And my mom was moving to South Carolina, you know, she was, and she got stressed out about what to do with the house, how she was going to sell it. 
uh, get rid of everything. And I thought, you know what? I didn't want to see the house go. But at the same time, I wanted to make the process easy for me and easy for my mom. And working with Larry and the team, uh, they made it easy for both of us. Uh, hi, this is Willie Proctor, and I just bought my first house with SaveWithConrad.com. And unlike the dirt sheets, we're not making this up. Check out all the five-star reviews. Go to SaveWithConrad.com and do it today. You'll be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Well, you be, you would become a motivational speaker along with having various mm-hmm. endorsement deals. How did your life change after retiring from wrestling? Well, it, in the, you know, they say it's a six week window, you know, for an Olympian, you know, so after six weeks, you know, they don't know your name anymore, so on and so forth. And <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, it's like, oh, well, let's see how long this lasts. And for me, I, I had no expectation because I didn't plan on winning. So as I got to stardom and as I started doing the talk shows and then the speeches and I, I started finding groups that wanted to listen to me as a speaker, you know, I found kind of niches in the speaking community and so many people are like, Holy cow, you know, you, you've been through all this and you have the grit determination and all this stuff and you keep going. And it's just like, man, if you can do it, I can do it. And that's, that's what this world is about. You know, we're here to, to learn about ourselves, but then also help each other learn about our potential and help them to realize theirs, you know, Kurt Angle and all the stuff he's been through over the years, I remember, you know, the Kurt Angle Classic, we wrestled the one year um, in Colorado Springs and Kurt would show up and, you know, all of his glamour and glory and glitz and nice looking singlets and stuff. But, uh, you know, he uh, he was somebody as everybody's like, man, that's Kurt Angle, man. That's that's cool. And that's that's what we want to be like. We, we want to be an ambassador to the sport and be able to, to carry the name on and wrestle for forever because, you know, not only is it an opportunity it's a responsibility. Well, uh, you find yourself on the biggest loser television show and you go on that show, you lose 173 pounds. Can you talk about that? Ex- excuse me. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? And then also, uh, why you left the show before it ended? Uh, sure. I can. It's, um, it looks like it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, if only I could tell you, um, <laughs> no, no, uh, oh, it's 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 crazy. The the show, you know, you get in a point in life where you're kind of just content, and you're just like, okay, this is cool, this is cool, you know, life is good, you know, not to worry. But you don't realize that you know you're putting weight on, you're you're not you know fitting in the same clothes, and you make excuses for yourself, and you don't make yourself accountable, and so finally. Uh, you know, people, USA Wrestling, I got inducted that year, and USA Wrestling's like, people there are like, hey, I think you need to think about trying out for the show. I'm like, what are you talking about? And the more I thought about it, I'm like, this could be an opportunity to reset myself, get myself back on track, and this is a great opportunity. So I applied, went in, got on the show, and then you you start to see, you know, the mechanics of, of weight loss and, you know, what it takes and all that stuff. You know, that becomes a simple process of information. You know, this is, you know, this is the calories I need to eat. This is the energy I need to expend. These are the workouts I need to do. These are the injuries I may sustain. And so you kind of just go through the process and then the biggest loser starts and they start adding all their drama and they want to see you pitted against other people. And, you know, when I was on the show, they're like, we love Rulin. He's the best guy ever. And he's an Olympic gold medalist. We were there supporting him. And you turn off the cameras and everybody's like stabbing you in the back and you're like, what? <laughs> it's just like, where'd this come from? And I, I thought everybody liked me. And it just was interesting because people were there for a reason. You know, people had a reason and agenda to, you know, become famous, you know, whatever it was, they all had their own agenda. And that's what I was doing. And as I got onto the show, I'm like, okay, I was, I was harmless. You know, I was nothing special. That's why NBC let me get on the show because I didn't look like anything special. I didn't have the ruling gardener of old. But once the show started, they're like, "This dude's legit." And we were in a chow- or we were in a practice one day um, with Bob and Jillian and uh, and Moses, one of the contestants. And so I, I started uh, pulling against Moses, and then Jillian jumped in, and then you know Bob jumped in. And I'm beating all three of them in a pull of, uh, tug of war competition. 
And I was <laughs> eating all three of them, and they're just like, this isn't humanly possible. I'm like, welcome to wrestling. This is what we do on a daily basis. And, and I ended up beating them, and they're like, this is nuts. And the, the first time I had a chance to work out with Bob and Jillian, they put me through a three-and-a-half-hour workout. I did 18 different types of lunges. I'm in there, and, and one of the workouts we did, you know, Jillian's like, okay, I want you to – jump on that box. I'm like, boop, there it is. They're like, you're 350 pounds and you jump on the box like that. I'm like, yeah, what's the problem? And then she's like, okay, now jump on the box on a BOSI ball. Okay, boop. You know, you jump on that, you catch your balance, and she's like, that's not possible. And then she's like, okay, do that with a medicine ball. And I had a 25-pound medicine ball jumping on, a, you know, like a 24-inch box onto a BOSI ball with – perfect balance into a squat and it just blew their mind. And they're like, Holy crap. And so as the show started going on there, you know, NBC didn't, their goal wasn't having me win the show. And so the more I got stronger and stronger, the more there was more resistance from the other contestants. And ultimately Jillian Michaels had never lost the biggest loser as a coach. And that became clear that it wouldn't be allowed. And um, three weeks from the, as we went to New Zealand, we went down there and we were doing our thing. We were doing production and all the rest of the stuff and nobody would talk to me. So there was like seven, eight other contestants and everybody was in one band and I had my own band. So I was like, whatever, I'm a wrestler. I'll be on an Island. I don't care where I, whatever. And so I was just loving it. And I come back from New Zealand and my weight loss started going right through the roof and came back and there was an issue. Um, Bob or the trainers, Dr. Heisinga, who was a former wrestler, he didn't like he didn't like chiropractors. And I had my broken neck. I'm like, I need to go see my chiropractor. And I'm like, well, you don't need to see a chiropractor. You know, we're you know, we'll give you a massage. I'm like, no, sometimes you need to be manipulated because of my neck. And they they didn't really want to support me. And so finally I got them because I told them, I said, you let me go see a chiropractor. I leave the show. And so they finally let me go see a chiropractor went in and saw a chiropractor, started being able to function again. And then uh, the last few days I came in and you, know, you realize I have a 250 page contract, <laughs> but uh, I came in and, uh, and all the contestants were meeting with production privately without me. I wasn't in any of these conversations and basically it was get rid of ruling or we all leave the show. And and I was like, what? I'm like, and so finally I came in and I was meeting with the owner, producer, and um, owner, producer, and three NBC lawyers. And they said, you have a choice. Read the writing on the wall. And I called Art Martori. I said, Art, what do I do? He's like, dude, it's NBC. You can't win this battle. I'm like, but I don't want to leave. They're like, at this point, it's not an option. You better just walk away. And that was three weeks away from three, you know, $250,000. And I, I went as, well, how much weight did I lose that week? Well, I lost 12 pounds. So I'd lost 12 pounds in 10 days. The girl, boy and girl contestants lost one to two pounds each. So I was, I was on my way. I was absolutely killing it that day. I left the biggest loser and I left the show. I had extra security, everything else. And I didn't leave by choice. Let's put it that way. My good. I lost 12 that way week so yeah so anyhow oh. but no it, it was it was a it was a good experience overall um did it end the way it should have no because i don't back down from nobody they had a challenge where we were pulling a car and this girl tara had beat all the boys and i'm pulling this car i'm 100 feet in front of her and all of a sudden my car got very heavy and we were in fontana on the raceway and my car was almost like lead and all of a sudden Tara started catching me and by the time we went across the finish line she beat me wow. wasn't because I was weak so it was yeah nothing uh, happened chicanery yeah. yeah oh yeah the, the challenges were they said that we have the right to change a challenge at any point mm. it doesn't have to be equal or, le- or equal or legal it's what we want to show oh yeah so yeah That's kind was, of messed up. And, and I, as I walked off, they're like, you lost to a girl. I'm like, yeah. I, under, I understood what was coming. 
And I, like, you lost a girl. I'm like, I had four sisters. I lost a mini girls. I'm good with it. <laughs> you, know, you know, I you know, I was like, no. I'm like, I, you know, I'm I'm good with myself. And you know, it did it blew me away. I was heartbroken. But what do you do at that point? So you pick up the pieces, and you know, that's where I was like, you know what? Let's give a run for this 2012. My heart wasn't in it. You know, I'm trying to get back to life and get everything back in order back in Utah. And you know, here you are doing that. So I did make a run for the 2012 and I was so close, you know, but I was, I was having to juggle so many things at that point that uh, I wasn't able to commit the time and effort. And at the end of the day, uh, I was working with the national team and I went with buyers the first day. And it would have been fun if I would have been able to make weight in 2012 because old girl still had it. <laughs> I know you did. Now, on another note, is it true that you survived a plane crash? And how do you keep escaping these things? <laughs> well, I think I, I don't know if it's escape. I think it's just too stu- just too stupid to die. You know, I haven't figured out the right way to die yet. So, uh, no, uh, um, you don't have many other options, Rula. <laughs> you'd be surprised. I, there's many more that we haven't talked about here. Um, no, in 2007, I was with two two friends of mine and one's a pilot and the other one uh, is a dentist. And he's like, Hey, you want to go see my, my house boat at Lake Palance, central Utah. I'm going to sell my boat. I'm like, sure. I'd love to. I was getting my private pilot's license at that point. So we took out of, off out of Spanish Fork, Salt Lake area. And we took off and headed down to Lake Powell. We landed at Lake Powell. I flew the whole way, landed at Lake Powell. And then as we got there, we went, checked his house boat out. Everything was cool. Lake was beautiful. And so it was February 24th. And so it's winter time. So it's getting a little bit colder. So we took off from Lake Powell and he's like, careful, you get closer and, you know, look at the beautiful lake. I said, sure. As we were looking at the lake, all of a sudden we were pulling up and, and the canyons were in and out and out. He's like, care if we get a closer view of the water. And I said, okay, that's fine. You're the pilot in command, you know, just make sure we're okay. And we started descending and we went from 600, 500, down to about a hundred feet. And I thought, should I remind him that we're still descending? The guy owns a multi-million dollar company. This is his plane. He's got 3000 hours. I'm not going to insult him and, and say something to him. And so right before we hit the water at 150 miles an hour, um, his brother in the back, he said, Hey, watch it. So we came up, we, we went left wing down and we hit the water and it just dove us straight over into Lake Powell at 150 to stop within a second and a half. And here I am standing, here I am sitting, looking water coming through the fuselage being like, are you kidding me again? You know, it happened to me with the frostbite and the snowmobile accident. And here I am now. So I got up there like, get your seat belts off, doors open, you know, open your doors. And so I'm standing on the, the door of the aircraft, you know, water's coming through the fuselage the plane's, you know, sticking its tail straight up in the air and I'm sitting there and they're like, well, you know, you need to jump in. I'm like, to where? And they're like, we're going to, we're going to swim to the beach. I'm like, I'm like, that's like two plus miles. It's like two miles away. And like, yeah. I'm like, why don't we go to the cliffs? It's closer. It's next to the channel. I said, it's a much smaller swim. I said, there's boats possibly. No, no, jump in. We're going. So I'm like, didn't want to be left. And so I grabbed my coat and my wallet. And I, you know, had those two and I jumped into the to lake as I jumped into the lake, the water was like coming up. And so it was basically almost drowning me and I'm kicking with my feet, doing everything I can. And I said to him, I said, Hey, you guys got to come help me. You guys are putting me in this situation. You need to help remedy the situation. So I asked that and the pilot swam over to me. As soon as he got close to me, I grabbed him and boom, dunked him. I left my wall, my coat behind. And I grabbed him. I dunked him. As soon as I dumped him, he went under and swam as far away from me as he could. He said, you're on your own, dude. I'm like, what? I'm like, you need to help pull me. He's like, every man for himself, we're out. Kick your shoes off and let's go. So the two of them just start, just, they just take off. I'm like, what the freak? I'm like, two minutes ago, I'm in a perfectly good aircraft. Now I'm drowning in the middle of Lake Powell. I'm like, what the heck? And so here are those two guys, you know, take off. And so. I get on my back and I just start swimming. And it took me almost two hours to get to the shore. And once I got to the shore, I went and I found the two of them. Or I got to the shore and I rolled up on the shore and 
I'm just in the sand and I'm just shivering. It took me almost two hours. The water was 43 degrees. So it was quite cold. And so I'm just shivering. And I'm like, you got to go find him. Got to go find him. So I got up and I walked around. It took me about 15 minutes to find him. As I got to him, there was no way. Um, I was, as I got to him, there, there's no way the pilot could stand up. And he was on the ground. I said, you need to get up. Let's go. You got to get up. And his other brother, um, I walked up to him. He said, you've done this before. You've been through it. Can we make it through it now? I said, I've been through this before. I've done this before. And if I made it through that damn swim, I'm not about ready to die now. Because it was just getting ready to start to get dark. And so it seemed like we were going to have to survive all night, you know, at the lake. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? I said, get him moving. Get him going. I'm going to create a little bit of a place where we have so a windbreak and then we can all three of us get down and snuggle together and survive the night and hopefully make it till morning time. That was our goal. And so the sun went down uh, about five thirty, six o'clock. And then all three of us uh, just sat there and, you know, then we'd all moan, Oh, it's so cold. And, you know, life sucks, this, that, the other. And everybody's kind of complaining. And I said, what do you guys have to complain about i said we're alive i said we'll make it through this just relax um the two of them the the pilot started talking about 2 a.m and he's like i'm so sorry you know that i put us through this i'm so sorry he's like and the other brother's like i thought you were a ghost coming to kill you know coming to save us i'm like if i'm a ghost i'm coming to kill you for leaving me in the middle of the lake (laughs) so i wasn't too happy at that point but yeah all three of us made it through the swim and uh at eight o'clock in the morning, a, a boat was coming by for a fishing tournament and he saw us and he waved us, or we waved him down and came over there and took us back in. And the plane went down in about 175 feet of water and um, all three of us survived. And luckily I was the only one that had a little cut on the, on my index finger. Everybody else was fine besides that. Kurt, listen, if there's one thing that I've learned on this show, it's not only his experiences, but you can't kill Rulon Gardner. Okay. He will not. You know what else? He needs to leave Utah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. Man, listen, (laughs) listen, you go on, you you're inducted in the national wrestling hall of fame in 2010. Congratulations on that. Before we let you go though, this week, this has been fascinating hearing your story. What can we promote for you and make sure that our listeners know about what's next for Rulon Gardner? Yeah, no, uh, RulonGardner.com. Um, people are looking for speakers, people to come in, you know, share, you know, my story. I, it could be really eh, not too much pom pom, but my story is just overcoming adversity. You get knocked down, you get back up, you get knocked down, you get back up, and you go through all that stuff. And, you know, that's it. You know, life, you know, we need to promote each other, lift each other up in this world. That's, that's what it's all about. And at the end of the day, um, 2004, um, I went and me and, and I got to see Kurt down in Phoenix in 2004. We were there with Vince and they walked in and Vince, you know, set me down and said, I'll make you 20 million. He said, but if I make you 20 million, you do everything I tell you. No questions, if, ands, or buts. He said, I own you. And I went home and I said, let me think about it. I went home, talked to my mom. I'm like, mom, what do you think? She goes, you're Lynn. Did I raise you to sell your values out, son? I'm like, you know what I think you should do? And I'm like, okay. Well, that's the reason I didn't do professional wrestling. Because hmm. my mom didn't think it was the right decision for me. And then uh, later um, in October that year, I actually signed, um, a con- well, I signed a contract in late September, October to fight uh, Hiroto Yoshida in pride fighting. And so I went to Japan and fought Yoshida. And I'd only trained six weeks. I trained with Henderson and Couture and all those guys and went to Japan. I won, uh, fought him and two to one underdog. And I beat him pretty good, pretty handily. They were surprised how quick my hands were, so on and so forth, and my wrestling skills. And yeah, it was good. And I, as I ended up beating them, uh, you know, they came back with an offer to fight Fedor and he said, we'll give you six fifty, and ended up with the, basically a million-dollar offer for me to fight Fedor. And I said, what do you think, Mom? She goes, Rulon, did I raise you to kill people? I said, no. She goes, why would you ever fight? Did you learn what you needed to from your first fight? I said, yeah. She goes, you're done. Mm. So, um, that's, that's, that's why I didn't do it. 
So every now and then I talk a little smack about people who are fighting and stuff and making fun. Cause you know, Billy Pierce always said that Brock, you know, talked about making the Olympic team. I'm like, come on, baby, let's have some fun. Let's, you know, let's, let's get you in there. Let's, let's go some body locks and let's have some fun. And me, me and that, uh, me and Jamil Byers and, uh, Kerry McCoy, one day we went 30 minutes to clinch. Body lock position, Colorado Springs. Me and Byers had the funnest time of our lives. We were just rocking and rolling. Kerry McCoy left so pissed off. And, you know, it was full body locks. It was it was war. You know, we loved it, man. It's, it's You wrestled. We, we wrestled not for the money. We wrestled because we wanted to be the baddest ass dude to show up on that mat. And that's me and Byers and Gafari. And, you know, we're all the same. You know, we're, we're just guys that love the sport. Not worried about being paid to do the sport, but, you know, love the sport because it represents what we love to do in life. And that's to, to show yourself, promote America. Those three letters on the back of your singlet meant more than anything else. USA. Yeah. You know, the name is the name. Well, guys, listen, check it out. RulonGardner.com. Roland, thank you so much for being with us this week. Kurt, this was great, wasn't it? Yeah, Rulon, thank you for being on the show. You're awesome, dude. I absolutely love you, and uh, hopefully I'll see you down the road. Hey, we need you. I need, me and you go out and you do a little bit more training, you know. Let's get that uh, on no, there. Do that. <laughs> Come on. I do, you would be beating on a You're disabled. You're not hitting me on a wrestling mat, Rulon. Not anymore. You'd be beating up on a disabled old man with nine toes. Would you feel good about that? <laughs> now, hey, if I did that, People would say you just beat up a disabled man. And if I lose, it makes me look even worse. <laughs> but the, the the funny part is America would be like, oh, yeah, that's just Kurt Angle. That's what he does. <laughs> wow. I love it. <laughs> awesome. We always got to have some fun. So. Yep. Good times. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much, you man. Both. Hey, you're good to go. Appreciate you being on, buddy. Love you guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. Uh, hey, all right. Take well. care. God bless, you man. Too. Yep. There it is, Kurt. Roland Gardner. That was a lot of fun, my man. Yeah, you know what? He's so humble but so confident at the same time. Uh, what a good person. You know, just a good man. He was. And listen, uh, we hope you uh, enjoy this. Sorry, a little bit of background noise throughout the show, uh, but that is is what it is. That was the best that he could do in the environment that he has. But, man, what a great in- interview that was. Lots of great stories. Kurt, next week... We are taking a break from all the interviews. We're going back to No Surrender 2008. And uh, another wrestling legend, and Frank Trigg, is heavily involved in TNA. You're in the main event because, of course, you are. And, uh, guys, check it out. Uh, impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. You can watch No Surrender 2008. Use the code angle, sign up, prep for next week's show uh, so that you can get yourself familiar. Kurt, I'm looking forward to uh, reliving that with you. I am too, man. I had a blast in 2008. There you go. Listen, guys, if your business does target that 25 to 54 year old demographic, you can advertise with us right here on the show. It's advertisewithangle.com and find out more how Kurt and I will read your ad, talk about your product or service right here on the Kurt Angle Show. Uh, It works and we do have a super uh, targeted audience. So make sure uh, you check it out again, advertisewithangle.com. I mentioned ad-free shows at the top of the show. Check it out. We have that promotion going on. Uh, And you can follow us on all of our social media handles, uh, specifically YouTube. Go over, like, subscribe, turn on those notifications. It's youtube.com forward slash the angle pod. And that's where you get to see Kurt's beautiful beard and his uh, good looking steel blue eyes that Giovanna fell in love with all those years ago, especially when he sings Aerosmith to her. Uh, it was a great time. <laughs> She's still in love with me. Oh, I know. She's I know. All those years ago. She's still in love with me. Did you guys have, did you guys uh, have love in an elevator playing at all? Yes. And I got to have it with the hottest wife in the world. Wow. I had a, I had a listener say, do you know if they, uh, if they have fun, the sweet emotion, I said, do you really want me to ask Kurt that on the air? He's like, yeah, yeah. I want to know. Kurt, what's wrong with our listeners? They're like us. They're perverted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> love They're exactly like us. I love them. Kurt, before we get out of hand, uh, talk about smart snacks. I got it right from Physically smart Fit. Smart snacks. There you go. Smart snacks, crispy protein bites. There's three different kinds. There's chicken snacks. There's uh, 
plant protein snacks, and there's also whey protein snacks. Uh, they all have uh, different flavors, uh, four different flavors for the whey protein and nine different flavors for the others. Uh, they're, they're incredible. You're going to absolutely love these. The flavors are amazing from cinnamon swirl to buffalo, wild, wild buffalo blue cheese, uh, sriracha, uh, honey mustard, Pizza. a lot of great flavors. You're going to absolutely love them. Go to Kurt Angle, uh, Jeez, physicallyfit.com. <laughs> you got too right. many websites for right now. You're a shiller, a full time shiller. <laughs> well, speaking of physicallyfit.com, that's physicallyfit.com. <laughs> for the years, you can use the code ANGLEPOD to get 20% off your first order, or you can go online on the website and sign up for life and get 20% off for life. Listen, he's telling you the truth about these smart snacks. Now, don't go with any of his freaking football predictions, but <laughs> go with the smart snacks. They are turning him into a shredded machine. Also, what's turning him into a shredded machine is Project One Nutrition Cookies and Freaking Cream. Kurt, tell him about that. Kurt Angle Cookies and Cream Protein, <laughs> Project One Nutrition. Uh, go to projectonenutrition.com. It's the best tasting protein on the market. Uh, we're doing extremely well right now. We're in uh, franchise GNCs. Eventually, we'll be in corporate GNCs. But you can go and order that at physically or, geez, projectonenutrition.com. Gosh, man, I got This is my favorite part of the show because and now let's get on to the, your favorite website that you wanted to talk about earlier, KurtAngleBrand.com. Whole ball of wax. That's where you're getting the whole ball of wax. You guys know what that is. The cameo <laughs> videos, the cowboy hats, the milk cartons, the bar mitzvah parties. You're getting everything from the KurtAngleBrand.com. <laughs> You get the whole ball of wax there. Anything you want, it's there at KurtAngleBrand.com. For the Kurt Angle lover in you. And uh, listen, uh, this has been an absolute great show. Great uh, hearing from Wulan and uh, Kurt. Uh, we're going to wrap it up for this week, man. I'll see you next week. This was a blast. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Really. I had a blast. Too. Thank you for being a part of your show. We really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> On behalf of your Olympic hero, Kurt Angle, this is Paul Bromwell. We'll see you right back here next week on The Kurt Angle Show. <laughs>